أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أدع إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين I'd like to thank uh, Imam Ahmed for being such a generous host, for allowing us to actually come through the doors of this masjid and to engage our brothers here in Tempe, Arizona. We're very humbled at the prospect of traveling the country and actually arriving at this location and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it a possibility for us to meet one another. We're very thankful you know, for the opportunity and uh, we're very humbled you know, at the prospect of being able to do the things that we're doing. So, um, <clears throat> my name is Jamil Sayed. I'm originally from Auburn Hills, Michigan. And I left my home on Friday, April 3rd uh, for the purposes of becoming the first Mu'addin in the history of the United States to be able to make the Adhan in all 50 states, inshallah. And this is state number 39. So, uh, we see some light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, Allah has been uh, extremely generous uh, with regards to the message you know, that we're looking to propagate in the sense that we have the mainstream media who has been extremely fair to us. If you read the articles in the Huffington Post, in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Detroit Free Press, the NBC News, if you read that, you will find that they have been very fair with regards to depicting the purpose and the mission of this trip. And when we decided to do this trip and we consulted with our traditional scholars, they said, you can't do something like this without praising the Prophet So, I subhanAllah said that this is very, very close to what I was thinking as well. So what do you have in mind? They said, if you're going to go visit your brothers, if you're going to go and visit your brothers, bring to them the best of the kalam of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So I asked, well, what, what would that be? So they said, subhanAllah, bring to them the khutbatul wida of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. For this was the best speech that he ever gave to all of humanity. So for 39 states now, inshallah, I will be reading the last sermon of the Prophet ﷺ. The third thing that we're setting out to do is actually a khidmah to you all. We want to come and we want to help tell your story, not only to the other Muslims in America, but to the Muslims outside of America, to the non-Muslims in America, and the non-Muslims outside of America. Because everyone knows that Muslims' reputation has gone down. That our, our reputation has been demonized. We have been associated with things that have absolutely nothing to do with us. Violence, extremism, radicalism. This is not Islam. You cannot demonize 23% of the world's population, 1 billion people, due to the actions of a few committed idiots that don't understand and fathom the principles of Islam, who are even arguably outside the role of Islam. You cannot do that to a people. So, as a father of a 13-year-old and a 4-year-old, and I have to explain to my son what he sees on the television, you know, I, I realize that you know, there's no point in playing defense. We should stop telling people who we're not. We're not this, we're not that. We're spending so much time and resource and energy and start telling people who we are. This is what we need to do. We need to author our own narrative. So I come into the massages and I take the pictures in the inside and the outside and the pictures of the people. And I interview the leader of the community. And I ask the person, tell us about your community. Tell us about the history of the Muslims in the area. Tell us about the demographics, the ethnicities. Tell us about the services that you provide for the Muslims in this community. And most importantly, now here comes the question, how do you improve society at large? How do you contribute to the educational system? to the social order, to the business system. And Muslims have been here even before Columbus came. We were here before Columbus was here. Then we were here through the enslaved Africans, then the civil rights movement, then the immigrants that came. 
We are everywhere. We are the healthcare practitioners. We are the high-level educators. We are the people who are entrepreneurs. We are the people who are the taxi drivers. We are the people who sell and give you your food. Muslims have been around and are around and have been contributing to the fabric of society in a very positive way, but we haven't been given that fair shake. So instead of complaining about it, why don't we put the microphone and the video camera in front of the leaders so that they can go ahead and talk about it. Alhamdulillah, 39 masajids across the United States have been able to author their own narrative. And if you go to Facebook and if you go to Twitter and Instagram and all these other social media icons, you will find that thousands of people are following us inside and outside America. SubhanAllah. But I would like to do the second thing that I've been commissioned here to do. And I want you to imagine now that you were back 1400, 1500 years ago. And I want you to imagine a sea of white clothes. And then within these white clothes, we find the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat, some of them who have been with the Prophet ﷺ from the first day, and some who are just joining him right now. And as diverse of a community that we have here in America, from one masjid to the other, some masajids, subhanAllah, chandeliers just like this with thousands of people flowing out. In Imam's masjid, Imam Majid's masjid in Sterling, Virginia, that was the situation when I was talking to the people. Other times in Montana, subhanAllah, not even a masjid, just a masallah. Just a few brothers here. But one thing that is in common is that when I have recited the kalam of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the respect, the love, the admiration that you all have shown has given me himmah. Because I have seen grown men shed tears, I have seen others go into deep contemplation, and yet there are others who are listening to these words for the first time, and then listening to the thousandth time, but they never had it read to them. And you should see the respect that they have, the concentration that they have for their Prophet ﷺ. So, I begin by reciting this unique ayah of the Qur'an. And the reason why it's differentiated amongst all of the ayahs is because out of all the commands that Allah has given to His human beings and to the angels, it's the only command in which He includes Himself. For when the name of the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned, He and His angels send salutations onto Him, so O oh, who you believe send a worthy salutation to Him. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين On the ninth of the Hijjah in the tenth year of Hijrah in the Urana Valley of Mount Arafah, after praising and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'll mention him by his name, the Messenger of Allah, Sayyidina Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh people, lend me an attentive ear, for I know not whether after this year I shall ever be amongst you again. Therefore, listen to what I'm saying to you very carefully. And take these words to those that could not be present here today. O oh people, just as you regard this month, this day, this city is sacred. So regard the life and property of every Muslim as a sacred trust. Return the goods entrusted to you to their rightful owners. Hurt no one so that no one may hurt you. Remember that you will indeed meet your Lord and that he will indeed reckon your deeds. Allah has forbidden you to take usury. Therefore, all interest obligation shall henceforth be waived. Your capital, however, is yours to keep. You will neither inflict nor suffer any inequity. Allah has judged that there shall be no interest and that all interest due to Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib shall henceforth be waived. Beware of shaitan for the safety of your religion. 
He has lost all hope that he will ever be able to lead you astray in big things. So beware of following him in small things. O oh people, it is true that you have certain rights with regards to your women, but they also have rights over you. Remember that you have taken them as your wives only under Allah's trust and with his permission. If they abide by your rights, then to them belongs the right to be fed and clothed in kindness. Do treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are your partners and committed helpers. And it is your right that they do not make friends with anyone whom you do not approve, as well as to never be unchaste. O oh, people, listen to me in earnest. Worship Allah. Say your five daily prayers. Pay your wealth and fast in the, during the month of Ramadan. Pay your wealth in zakah. And if you can afford to, make hajj. All mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab. Nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over a black. Nor a black has any superiority over a white. Except in piety and good in action. Learn that every Muslim is a brother to every other Muslim and that all Muslims constitute one brotherhood. Nothing shall be legitimate which belongs to another fellow Muslim unless it was given freely and willingly. Do not therefore do injustice to yourselves. Remember one day you will appear before Allah and answer for your deeds. So beware, do not stray from the path of righteousness after I am gone. O oh people, no prophet or apostle shall come after me and no new faith shall be born. Reason well, therefore, O people, and understand the words which I convey to you. I leave behind me two things, the Qur'an and my example, the Sunnah. And if you follow these, you will never go astray. All those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and others to others again. And may the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me directly. Be my witness, O Allah, that I have conveyed your message to your people. My dear brothers and sisters, there have been some great personalities that have come on this earth. Kings, leaders, philosophers, educators, business people, thought trenders, all of these people, all of these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them hikmah and hidayah. Muslim and non-Muslim, people have written their words down and inscribed them on big monuments. And they have echoed these words and they teach these words and they live by these words and they propagate these words. And they reference the people who gave these words. But I swear in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this masjid that all of their words and all of those men are dwarfed in the shadow of the Prophet For this kalam, this speech is the most eloquent speech that has ever been composed, iterated, and reiterated in the history of humanity. Think about it. What does this mean? that may the last ones understand it better than those who hear it from me directly. And who were those? Who were those? They were the Sahaba Ajma'een radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that we would be in need. Look at our situation. People ask us about violence. People ask us about gender equity. People ask us about oppression. And the best of our leaders are unable to go ahead and give adequate answers. And here comes the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this three minute speech, you have gender equity, racial equity, social justice. We have the direct command not to hurt and harm anybody. We have best practices in commerce and in business ethics. We have a call to unity. And this was not meant for Muslims, this was meant for humanity. We have a call to unity. And SubhanAllah, every single item that they attack the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on, is all clarified right here in this khutbah. So what is our responsibility? What is our responsibility? I tell you, our responsibility is to take these words to others, as the Prophet ﷺ asked and commanded us to do. We belong to a chain going back to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu at this point. It would be a tragedy. All my work would have been spent water upon if I just came here and said it and you heard it and you say, MashaAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this brother and may give him success. This is not what this is about. I am an ambassador to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in this situation. I am bringing something to you so that you act upon it. 
Take these words to your wives. Take them to your children. Take them to your co-workers. Take them to your interfaith partners. Take them as far as you can. For a long time, this speech has been collecting dust. And the reporter asked me, well, what is the goal? Well, what are you trying to achieve? I said, well, ultimately, we're trying to get, capture the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you want metrics, if you want to measure something, I want the adhan, the words of the adhan to go viral across the world. I want the words of the Prophet والسلام, to go viral across the world. I want the Muslims to be able to have some izzah, some respect in this world. And ultimately, a mu'adhin, and we know what the status of the mu'adhin is. For the Rasul Sallallahu one time bought the Bilal عنهم, to him and he said, what have you done? What have you done so special in your ibadah? So the Sahabi inquired, why are you asking? Because when I was entering Jannah, I heard your footsteps ahead of me. The first person to enter Jannah will be a mu'adhin. What else did the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He said that when the adhan is made as far as the voice will carry, Everything which is animate and inanimate, meaning alive and not alive, will testify him for the day on the day of judgment. What else did the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam say? He said, when the adhan is made and the people come, the mu'addin will get a carbon copy reward of all of those people who are praying behind him. And as a result, what will this be? That on the day of qiyamah, he will have the height. He will be able to see the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anyone else. And the scholars interpret this as saying that he will taste the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anyone else. This is the muqam, this is the status, this is the station that Allah gave to the mu'adhin. And I intend to make the entire world my witness, inshaAllah, beginning with the United States. For mu'adhins are competitive in nature. Yes? Right? I wrote an article the other day called The Essential Mu'adhin in the most the most influential Muslim blog called Muslim Matters, called the Essential Mu'addin, and we describe what is, what goes to the heart and mind of the Mu'addin. We're very, very punctual with regards to time, because the time of Salah has to come. We're very paranoid for anyone to come take our spot. And if we give up our spot, I guarantee you we'll give it up to somebody who's better than us. And if they're better than us, I guarantee you that we are studying their style, so that we can incorporate that and add that to us. This is the nature of it, and it came it was started by Bilal radiallahu ta'ala for his character. And I'd love to say this, I love to say this, is that of unconditional loyalty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For when his back was on the grains of the hot sands of the Arabian desert, and there was a boulder placed upon his chest, and he was being prodded to go ahead and denounce Islam, what was his response? Ahadun, ahad, ahadun, ahad. Right? He didn't let it go. And Allah and His Messenger loved that so much, they made that the slogan of the most important battle in the history of Islam, the Battle of Badr. This, this is the Mu'addin al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very strong, tall, handsome man, powerful man, unconditional loyalty, subhanAllah. So I plead to you, number one, to take the khutbat al-wudah to your people. Second thing, we should try to make it into the masjid. No question about it. Every single salah, every single day. We should try to do that. But if by chance we can't and we wander praying at home, please make the adhan. Make the adhan. And don't say, oh, my son needs to hear this. That's the wrong response. Your son is weak. He doesn't have the confidence yet. He's still growing. He's still maturing. It is the responsibility of the Amir and the Khalifa of the household to establish Salah, and that happens with Adhan. So he should make the Adhan. If not him, the grandfather. If not the grandfather, then the uncle. If not the uncle, the older brother. For when you establish the Salah or the Adhan, the people will come in Jama'ah. You don't even have to talk with one another. How many Muslims are struggling with their families, with their children? Right? They talk back, the Tarbiyah is not there, the Adab is not there. Some of them are even saying, hey, I don't know about this whole Muslim thing. How do you solve this problem? That's when you get up at the hajjud and you're, and you're making sujood. Allah, please help me. He will help you if you help yourself. And the first step to that is your salah. Make the adhan, the people will come. You don't have to talk with one another. All your foreheads are on the ground towards the qibla. There's barakah in this. There's barakah in this. This is how we solve world issues, complex issues. Allah has simplified it for us. And why the salah? Not something which I'm saying. 
something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for when you're six feet under, you won't be first questioned with regards to how much sunnah you practice, how much Quran you memorize, how much sadaqah you gave, how many degrees you have, how much wealth have you amassed. You'll be asked about your salah first and foremost. This, brothers and sisters, is the deliverable of the mu'adhan is the whole reason why the Mu'addin has been given his status. is because he calls the people to pray. And tell you about the Adhan, Allah architected in such a way that it pulls the strings of your heart. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? When you hear a beautiful Adhan, isn't it irresistible? Isn't it irresistible to respond to that call? Ask Yusuf Islam. Ask the reporter from BBC. Ask hundreds upon thousands upon millions of people. Muslim and non-Muslim, when the adhan is given, it is irresistible but to respond to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I apologize for taking too much time. I understand it's a weekday and I really, really appreciate the time that you have spent. And one thing that I would say this, and I'm convinced of this in my travels, that I'd like to congratulate you because I firmly believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hundreds, maybe thousands of Muslims that could have been here, in this particular masjid. I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pulls the people into the masjid to hear these words. The words of the Prophet Very, very, very lucky. Very lucky to be here. And I consider myself to have won a lottery ticket. Out of the billions of people on this earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me in a position to be able to take this. And I'm not uh, ungrateful with regards to this. I understand the weight that comes with this. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our intentions sincere. For the sake of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us together as a community, as an ummah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give our children the proper guidance, to keep them protected, to be able to help them understand the character of the Prophet alayhi wa and let them be the instruments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses and chooses to spread this deen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of us those individuals. Subhanallah, I was in Majl al-Haram. My father, rahimahullah, was a professor of the University of Michigan, and he passed away at the age of 63 in 2003. He had intentions of making Tursa'at uh, al We are at my uncle's place. And, uh, and when we were there, we, you know, it was cold, it, we're in Michigan, and subhanallah, you know, uh, we told him, I said, look, you don't have to go out there, you're a heart patient, just pray, make your qiyam at home. We put pressure on him. And so he succumbed to the pressure, and the party was downstairs, so he went upstairs where the kids were. And so all the kids were playing, and he was there playing with my son, which might have been a, a year and a half at the time. Somebody turns on the television. What's on the television? Masjid al-Haram. Taraweeh is going on. Tawaf is happening. Something moved his heart. He left the house and didn't tell anyone. He went. I got a phone call. Maybe about 45 minutes later. You need to come to the masjid immediately. So I come. And the president of the masjid, you know, it, it is pin drops. There's hundreds of people there. Pin drop silence. And the president comes to me and said, your father came and he prayed Salat al-Isha. Then he prayed Salat al-Sunnah. And in the second rakah, in the second sajda, as I was praying next to him, I heard him breathe his last breath. What I've been doing since then is sadaqah jari. We are extremely lucky that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opportunity to serve our parents even after their demise. But for a person who passed away saying subhanahu rabbi al-ala with wudu, in sujood, praying sunnah, in the month of Ramadan, in the masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what his station and status is. My son, he's 13 years old, he's memorized 19 juz. MashaAllah, he's on his way to be a hafiz Qur'an within the year. I have to ask myself, what about Jameel? What about Jameel? What do I have to offer? And a miskeen. People ask, you know, what drives you to do something like this? This is what drives you. This is what drives you. You realize that when you're competing for good deeds, you're falling short. And when we go for job interviews and school interviews and people talk about Harvard and Oxford. We all know that a 4.0 itself isn't going to get you in. You got to come up with something better than that. We all know that all your extracurricular activities isn't good enough. You got to come up with something better than that. You have to even know somebody in certain situations to get you into that institution or to get you that job. What makes us think that we can just get Firdos like this? What makes us think that we can just have the company of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa You're going to have to earn it. You're going to have to compete. And that too with hundreds and millions of billions of people who are better than us. That were better than us. So inshallah, this is the whole point of this. 
So I ask you, you know, Jazakallah khairan, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you to make dua for this mission. And I, I would be incomplete with regards to mentioning my sponsors by name. And the reason being is because I didn't go after these sponsors. And uh, Imam Ahmad is very good friends of a man who basically has opened up this entire thing for me. Very selfless. Not one time did Ayman Abu Rahma ask for a fundraising opportunity. Not one time did he turn around and say, hey, look, can you put our banner on the website? Not one time did he do this. It was when he heard about this thing, he said, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to be a partner in this. This is what he said. Life for Relief and Development. Syrian American Medical Society. Baytul Mal. Helping Hands. The Zagat Foundation. All of these are relief organizations. How come there's no physicians here? How come there's no businesses? How come there's no travel agencies? And I didn't go after any of them. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to connect us with those people who are sincere. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring those people part of this project who are sincere. These brothers and sisters are the people on the front lines. They are the ones who are supporting our unfortunate brothers and sisters, the miskeen, the orphans, the people who don't have food, that don't have clothes, the people who cannot take care of themselves. These are the brothers and sisters who are doing this. I ask you to support them in whichever way you wish. If you wish to go online and even give a dollar, do it before shaitan goes ahead and decides to dissuade you. Say, hey, that dollar could be used for something else. If you don't have a dollar, make dua for them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them success in this world and the hereafter. And the people that they're trying to you know, influence and, and, and help, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them in success. And subhanAllah, our funds have just basically run out now. So we're just, you know, whatever help you're able to provide for me directly would be appreciated. If you cannot, please go ahead and make dua for us. There's 10 more stops to go before we make history in the fabric of the United States. That they would know, inshallah, that there is a mu'addin and there is a call to prayer. 10 more stops. Make, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the way and gives us protection and gives us falah. All of us, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. We'd love to take one big picture for everybody. We're on social media. You should be putting this on Facebook. The Saudi Gazette, we have hundreds of articles all over the place. We'd like to know that, we'd like to show the Muslims in Tempe, Arizona. So please come over here and, you know, let's take pictures, inshallah. You know, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I will be interviewing Imam Ahmed shortly so he can represent your community properly. Barakallah. Is there any other questions? A lot of people have questions. I apologize. You know, um, people are very curious. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, yeah,